All right, good morning, everyone. It's time for our panel on lessons learned from the summer of supply chain attacks. And I am not speaking, so I'm gonna turn it over to the panelists. Good morning. <laughs> I'm Lynn Brown from Wiley. I will be your moderator today. 2003 was a, a record-breaking year for supply chain attacks. And this morning, we're gonna discuss a few of them, give you some concrete examples, and talk about lessons learned with experts from the security, legal, and communications um, communities. But first, I'd like for my panelists to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Erin Joe. I'm with the Office of the CISO at Google Cloud. I help customers with security modernization and cloud transformation. Um, I'm Megan Brown. I'm a, the co-chair of Wiley's Privacy, Cyber, and Data Governance Practice, where we've been advising um, companies in critical infrastructure and technology for about 15 years on cyber incidents and policy. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Burnside. I'm part of Mandiant Google Cloud's crisis communications team, where we help clients respond to incidents, as well as prepare proactively in building out playbooks and testing those plans and playbooks. Thank you. So let's talk about last year's uh, supply chain attacks and what we can learn from them. Erin, can you give us a few examples of the kinds of attacks that we witnessed last summer and talk about their significance? Sure, we put these into two categories. One is when the threat actors use exploits to get into something that's already in our digital supply chain. And then the second is when threat actors use implants, putting something that doesn't belong into the product itself, and that's what we consider to be a true supply chain attack. Both are worth a conversation here today. So let's talk about some examples. The first I'll use is Barracuda. It's when China uh, Nexus espionage threat actors sent emails with malicious files attached, and then when opened, the, uh, the threat actors were able to exploit a vulnerability in the email security gateway. I really credit Barracuda for sharing a lot of information about this case because we did learn a lot. And I'll share five points with you. One is that the threat actors also sent emails of low quality that were caught by spam filters. And that means that just because you have an attack that is being caught by your spam filters, it doesn't mean there's not another attack that's getting through. And we see other threat actors using these tactics as well. The second is we're learning a lot about the way that threat actors are behaving once they gain access into an environment. In this case, they used three, three malware families that masqueraded as legitimate. In other cases, we see the threat actors being very capable and able of using what we call living off the land. They're using what's already natively available in your environment in order to hide. The third is, the lesson learned here is to watch for ways that the threat actor exfiltrates the data, because that's a detection opportunity for you. In this case, alerting to the creation of temp files would have been important, because that's the way these threat actors stage the data large amounts of data before exfiltrating that to, to threat actor controlled infrastructure. The fourth thing I'll mention is, is most interesting to me. Incident response is no longer a game of, of cat and mouse. It's a game of chess. The threat actors are watching the incident responders and sometimes they're directly reacting to what the incident responders are doing by changing their tactics or deleting or destroying information that would be critical for incident responders. And in other ways, they are taking different strategic moves in order to maintain persistence. And that takes me to the fifth point, which is we have to examine the things that are in our process for response and recovery, because the threat actors have done that. And they are looking for and exploiting ways that, and ways that they can maintain persistence even though we are involved in recovery and response. And here's an example in this case was the vendors typically send out, in, in this case, just like in all the cases, they send out updated, updated software, updated hardware, and they know that we're going to install it. The threat actors in this case hid backdoor malware in the configuration files so that as the uh, customers were using the updated clean versions, they were still downloading backdoor malware. So those are things that we, we can detect for and we can watch for and we can learn. The next case is MoveIt. Here we have financially motivated threat actors who 
exploited a, a zero day exploit and they were able to access an open instance that gave them access to a tremendous amount of data that they exfiltrated. So much data they couldn't even handle it themselves. We learned two things. One, they did try to reach out to some victims, but many of those communications were never received by the victims because they were filtered out by spam filters. The second is that they had so many victims that they could not individually reach all of them. So instead, they posted to shaming sites, victim shaming sites, that if you think you've been victimized, here's how you can contact us to arrange your extortion payment to prevent the disclosure of your data. Creative. What we learned here, I think, two things. One, we're going to talk later about the importance of good data governance, because if we had been deleting data off of this system, perhaps it wouldn't have been there to be, to be stolen. But the other here is how you need to be monitoring sites. We talk a lot about telling, telling you to monitor sites for data that's been disclosed so that you're aware of it, but here you're monitoring for a warning that you've been compromised and you don't know it yet. In fact, last year in about 50% of the cases that Mandiant responded to, they were the victim was notified by an outside party in some way. And in ransomware cases, 70% of the time it was from the threat actor themselves. So that tells us we really do need to be alert to, the, to those communications. And the last is a really interesting true supply chain attack. We refer to it often as 3CX, but the attack started earlier than that. The North Korean threat actors were able to put an implant into trading software. 3CX has acknowledged that an employee downloaded that trading software onto a personal laptop. And that from there, those threat actors were able to gain access into the build environment of the desktop application. From there, they did another, they put another implant into the 3CX software that was downloaded by the customers of 3CX. And they began alerting to malicious activity. This is the first time that we've seen cascading events in a supply chain attack like this. So it's very concerning. It tells us that threat actors have these intents and capabilities. So we're seeing them play out. And it also tells us two things. One, I think we can talk for a long time, and I, I encourage you to attend other sessions about securing the build environment, securing our processes around development, which were relevant here. But for this purpose today, I think it's important for us to talk about how do we better secure our human and how do we better secure access into critical environments and data with things like zero trust, secure browsing, and, and ongoing, um, ongoing validation of who's in your environment and what they're doing. That's great, thank you. Jen, you have considerable experience in, in this. Can you talk about what you've seen and particularly with respect to threat actor communications? Yes, certainly. So again, working incident response, the most common activity that we're responding to these days is multifaceted extortion, right? And where the threat actor is really using the public domain in order to exert pressures on companies and organizations to monetize their activity and ultimately get paid. So again, it's gone from where ransom was the ultimate action to stealing the data and putting pressure on companies is really the action. So what we've seen in this, this added pressure is we've seen threat actors reaching out to executives, employees, board members, vendors and customers, and usually, you know, of course, displaying what amount of ransom is being requested. And the problem is that a lot of these individuals are shocked when they get that call. They might not know that an incident is ongoing or that a company's responding to. The second piece is that we've seen the threat actor get even more aggressive, where a threat actor starts reaching out to family members of those board members, those employees. Two cases in point. One was a threat actor reached out to an executive's spouse and sent flowers to their home. Can you imagine your spouse or partner getting flowers at home, how shocking that would be? The second was a case of an executive where the threat actor was reaching out to their individual son on their cell phone. Same token, can you imagine a threat actor reaching out to one of your loved ones, a call out of the blue, how shocking that would be? 
So walking away from those examples, one of the biggest lessons learned, and I ask that all of you take this away and think about what of your information is posted on open source on the web. Um, you know, take those actions for your employees, your executives, your boards. Ask them to delete their public data that's out there where possible, especially that of their home address or their phone numbers. That's good advice. So Megan, how did industry react to this? What were your clients concerned about? What do you think the lessons learned are from a legal perspective? Well, I think one challenge is supply chain is a very broad concept and we've seen a lot of um, incidents. And you know, one thing I've taken away is there's just a varying degree of preparedness for some of these um, supply chain attacks of, of various varieties, right? Companies are in taking in an Im Im immense amount of information from the government, um, warnings for this, alerts for that, and I think some were caught surprised, and, and I think it was a lesson about um, how your contract terms, how your relationships with your vendors and your suppliers and your customers, you, you need to factor that in. It's something we'll talk about shortly, but you know, the government has been sort of um, you know, emphasizing this for a long time, but I think last year, at least I saw several sectors and companies who really kind of had that um, eyes open moment where they realized you know, they, they weren't sure, for example, how to extract actionable information from a vendor, um, whether their contract terms gave them certain rights to um, help, right? right? And so I think that was, to me, that was a big um, lesson learned. I think companies were also surprised at the government oversight, and we can talk about this as well, but right, the Securities and Exchange Commission was very interested in the supply chain issues right. um, and, and took a broad view of them, not just related to um, the company itself that had the software or the product or the issue that had the issue, but how that trickled through the economy, what companies were being affected by it. And I, so I think, you know, not, companies are still on their sort of um, maturity journey for cyber readiness, but I think that was a crystallizing issue that, you know, understanding your contractual obligations and being prepared to take on and, and, and process this kind of vendor, customer, supplier, or software issue. Um, and again, supply chain is very broad, so there's, there's a, lot to go, a lot going on. Great. So let's talk about emerging trends. Aaron, what are you seeing emerge um, in terms of trends for the year 2024? What should people be thinking about as the year progresses? Yeah, I think there are three things to watch for. One is the continued use of exploits, particularly the zero days that we're seeing. We've seen those rise over the years. A few years ago, we saw an excess uh, mandate would see in in the public domain being used over 50 and over 80. Well, last year was over 90. Those are just the zero day exploits, let alone all the other exploits that we're seeing, particularly those that are affecting the things that are in our digital world, our digital supply chain. And we do see this one to many attack type taking, taking over. And I think some of the reason is that our endpoint detections and capabilities are, are stopping some of the things at the endpoints. But really, those edge devices are still out there without good ways for us to monitor or detect uh, changes or issues or problems. So the very things we're using for security become the very things that the threat actors are targeting. Things like our firewalls, our VPNs, our virtual machines, et cetera. So I think that's going to continue. Uh, the second thing I'd watch for is I, we do anticipate these aggressive tactics continuing. Early on, we would talk about ransomware as being what to watch for, and then it turned into the multifaceted extortion of ransomware plus extorting you again for, uh, uh, for payments not to disclose your data. Now we're talking about even more aggressive actions where the threat actor is not only watching what's happening on the network with the defenders, but now they're actually prepared to engage you and your families or your corporate, uh, your, your, in your corporate interests. So that, that level of aggression, I think, is something to be watching for. The third thing to watch for, somebody's got to say it, AI. <laughs> so it's, it's, the ta it's everybody's talking about it, right? So we do see the threat actors starting to experiment with it. It hasn't necessarily been uh, what we've been detecting as the problem so far. But when, when we think about what to watch for, it's going to be the use of AI that gives threat actors the ability to create better quality uh, communications for emails and different types of phishing. We will also see better quality um, influence operations and information operations that will be used. 
I think it could be used to create information that could be used to extort you that might be false, but it's been created by AI, but you, you might not know that or not have a way to prove it. So I think those are particularly concerning. And then eventually, the same way we're using AI to, to uh, ad advance our technological processes, the, the threat actors are, are working with it and eventually will be able to gain uh, better te technical capabilities through the use of AI. Okay, thanks. Megan, let's talk about shifting government expectations. How have you seen expectations shift regarding cyber preparedness and cyber incident reporting? It's a great question, and I, I will say the expectations are shifting rapidly and in many, many areas. To go back to my comment that supply chain means a lot of different things, the government is doing a lot of different things, and I have my notes so that I don't miss a couple of them. I think of these shifting expectations in kind of two main buckets. One is the expectations for your baseline, third-party risk management, supply chain risk management. I know I'm con I'm, that there's a lot in there. And then there's sort of the incident reporting side of things. And I'm seeing supply chain issues come up and, and sort of be um, raised to the fore in both, right? Sort of just as a couple of examples on the former category, right, NIST has been doing a lot on supply chain. Um, for those of you who participated in the development of 2.0 of the cyber framework, you might have seen some discussions, some spirited discussion about whether to create a seventh function in the CSF for supply chain and third party issues. Uh, that didn't end up coming to fruition in, in 2.0. I think that was a good thing from my personal perspective. Uh, but supply chain surfaced throughout 2.0 in a more directive and um, deliberate way. So I think that's a big sign that supply chain is increasingly on the government's mind. There's several other NIST publications where supply chain is sort of front and center. Um, and then you can see other sort of regulatory pushes towards focusing on supply chain, whether it's accountability focused or just sort of uh, promoting best practices. A few examples to highlight. Um, DHS has been doing several things under the broad lens umbrella of supply chain. One, their, their cross-sector cyber performance goals, which are out. Um, several folks in industry worked with them on that. Um, supply chain is a big piece of, of that set of goals. They also have been doing a lot on software bill of materials and sort of the secure by design aspect. I see Alan give me a little uh, pump there. So um, that's, that shows the diversity of supply chain issues. And then you've got sort of real regulatory obligations with teeth. Um, the Transportation Security Administration has had several emergency cyber directives that address, that are starting to address aspects of supply chain. Um, you've got New York DFS has um, its rules for cyber, includes supply chain oversight, and the Federal Trade Commission has been out there nudging through guidance, but also in enforcement actions. They tagged a company recently with a, a several million dollar fine. One element of their problems allegedly was um, sort of inadequate third-party risk management. On the reporting side, I think you're also seeing this um, interest in supply chain by um, the government expanding the triggers for mandatory reporting. So two examples there, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, had some controversial rules that have gone into effect that require public disclosure of material cyber events as well as discussions of governance. I think they believe supply chain is a part of that. I think the impetus for some of those, those rules and um, congressional action as well was uh, solar winds and some of these um, high profile um, events that got the attention of policymakers. And then the last one I'll, I'll highlight, uh, in part because the rulemaking is still open, so I encourage folks to review it, is the Department of Homeland Security was told by Congress to go out and create broad new incident reporting mandates. They have included in their definition of a covered cyber incident uh, supply chain compromises. And uh, I think if you read the rules, I'm seeing a lot of chatter from regulated entities that the rules are a little unclear and that um, the, the concept and definition of supply chain compromise in those rules is maybe quite broad. And so that's just a, a flavor of some of the government expectations that are shifting. And I think they are really trying to push the private sector um, beyond what current, I think, law and best practices really are. But that's, that's an overview of the expectations game. Right, and for anybody that's interested in, in potentially commenting on the CIA and PRM that Megan uh, mentioned, it's open now until July 3rd. The comment yes. period is open now until July 3rd. Yep. So that covers the domestic front. 
Jen, can you weigh in on what you've seen on the international front, especially with respect to global threats and international cooperation? Certainly. Internationally, again, through Barracuda and the email security gateway compliance uh, that we saw, compromise rather, is the importance to notify those international partners. During the middle of an incident, encouraging a company that is a duty to warn and it's important to share information is really key. In the case, we had 12 country briefings that were done as part of that incident. And again, sharing information helps to you know, create a clearer picture. Um, and by that, I mean sharing those in indicators of compromise, those tactic techniques and procedures. So net defenders can, of course, recognize if there's a, an expanded um, risk in their own environment. The other piece of the international cooperation piece was that law enforcement and intelligence community partners were able to bond together and, of course, take down some of these threat actors' infrastructure. And that's key, right? And again, if we take away their infrastructure, it, it gives them a, a little more pain, right? The other piece of it, too, is you have to recognize, even though we may, it's like a hydra, even though we may cut off part of that hydra, it reconstitutes. And sometimes they've made copy of that data and they're able to continue, again, their activities. So where we can, again, talk to your organizations, think about what is gonna be your information sharing practice whenever, you know, if and when it comes your day. Um, because again, that's key. And the more law enforcement intelligence community can do to help secure our, our environments together, right, by removing those infrastructure, that's key. Yeah, thank you. So in terms of supply chain um, preparedness and, and risk tolerance, Aaron, we've talked about the attacks, we've talked about the risks. Can you elaborate on what organizations should be, should be thinking about? How, how can they prepare? How can they reduce risk? Yeah, I think there's three strategies that come to mind. One is about how you're going to handle intelligence and information. And that's everything from how you're going to get it in, how you're going to action it, and then what you're going to share back out. So let's, let me break that down a little bit. Right now, if you're waiting for the threat actor or the government to tell you you're compromised, it's a little late. So it's about making sure that you are positioned with the right in information and intelligence feeds and you know exactly how you're going to get information about a compromise. And that might be for you to make sure that you're looking, I think particularly at the power of the contract, right? Talking to your vendors, working through things with your vendors up front with how will you notify me if you have a problem? What can I expect to get from you and when? What, what will the ongoing communication look like? When can I expect that you'll be providing additional either information or remediation to me or mitigation information to me? And that's true because many of these are happening not only with various vendors that you're, you're navigating and negotiating, but also you're trying to conduct investigations in a multi-cloud environment. So you need to have these answers from your cloud providers too, asking what will you share with me? How will I get what I need? Where are the logs? Where is the evidence? How will I get it? When I have to conduct an investigation, how will I make sure that I'm getting access to all the things I need to conduct a thorough investigation? Those are things that you now have to think about in ways that I think are exponentially more challenging and complex than ever before. I think another thing is that we have examples that because you know, we're, Mandiant is out on the front lines and they're seeing these, um, we're, we're seeing these attacks on the front line as they're, as they're happening, we're able to take what we're learning from that and apply it, both the mitigation and remediation across all of our customer sets. And now we have ways to make that information and intelligence available to you. And you should have various intelligence feeds that are informing you of what's happening in near real time and giving you the, the near-term mitigation as well as those longer-term solutions. I think another uh, part of the strategy, second part of the strategy, is what we're here for at RSA. Automation, technology. How can you leverage it better to improve not only prevention, but then also response. Many of the lessons we've learned from the cases we've talked about could have been automated or have ways that you can bring technology and automation into your environment to make, it, to make those detections happen faster. So detecting to changes in configuration files or the creation of temp files or, 
or all the various ways that we see the threat actors uh, behaving. If you start to break down those behaviors and, and improve your detection capabilities, you will be in a better position to defend. And the third thing is around data protection, right? Because if that's one of the ultimate goals of the threat actors is to get data that they can then use against you, and if that's one of the biggest problems that you have to defend against is once they get my data, I'm in a very vulnerable position, then really focusing on your data governance and data protection practices is critical. Again, I mentioned data deletion. Don't leave your data in places where it doesn't need to be. And if it's not there, the threat actors can't access it. But then really look at all the various ways that you can implement zero trust capabilities where you can continually challenge who is accessing this data from where, how, and to do what. And that has to be an ongoing process. And you can also employ other tactics for data protection, including multiple layers of encryption, including separating that data in various places. Anything that you can do to make it more difficult for the threat actor to get information and, and data from you that they then can use against you will better position you. That's great, thank you. So Megan and Jen, I wanna throw this question out to, to both of you. Um, what do you think that companies should be thinking about in terms of risk tolerance? What should they be evaluating you know, as they move towards trying to prepare more for a cyber incident? Okay, so I, I was listening to Aaron Joe sort of talk about the things that um, companies should be considering doing, and I guess before I jump into that, it just struck me candidly as like, it's overwhelming for a lot of companies who maybe are not um, at the level to have Mandiant on retainer to be feeding them this information. I think one thing that I struggle with in advising clients is you do have this level, these different levels of maturity, which right, NIST and the government have recognized. Um, but to go to Lynn's question, you know, what should companies be thinking about and how do you adjust your risk? I think that's kind of, that's the, that's the $64,000 question to date myself is, you know, what is your risk tolerance based on not just where you are in the economy and what the threats are that you face, but your resources, right? There's a lot of stuff that the government might expect you to do, and I come to this with a, with a government lens because I help folks deal with investigations and compliance, but the government may have some unrealistic expectations about what is possible for a lot of companies, and I know there's capacity building and there's a lot of effort underway um, to, to bring up some of those parts of the economy, but the, the thoughts I had were to pick up on what Aaron Joe said, data governance is really important. That doesn't have to be one size fits all for every company, right? Data governance is, you know, um, I don't wanna say choose your own adventure, but you have to figure out what your risk um, exposure is and then what your risk tolerance is, taking into account your resources. You've gotta prioritize, right? Not everyone can, can do the A plus job on day one, so it's kind of a journey, like zero trust. Right? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a nice aspiration, but the government has recognized it's a journey, and it's gonna look very different for different um, companies, sectors, et cetera. Um, and you know, the other thing that I would say is um, understanding where you are in the regulatory risk um, landscape, because the government has started to impose actual very meaningful obligations on some sectors, but hasn't gotten to other sectors yet. Um, and so that's something to just, as a company, you have to figure out sort of where I sit and am I a supplier to one of those companies that sits in a highly regulated space? And this is gonna be obvious to the ambience of the world, but maybe less so to others. But I think that's kind of how I think about this risk tolerance and sort of picking where you, you start and what your biggest threats are. Well, Jen, what are your thoughts on risk tolerance and preparation? You know, to foot stomp the previous two panelists about data, right, and mapping that data. The first question I have for the technical team and for our clients when we're responding to an incident is what potential data was impacted and some clients honestly have no idea they don't know where their data is mapped to what type of data it is how old the data is right and we saw that especially in the supply chain attack that was that was uh, related to the managed file transfers right organizations couldn't even start to tell us what data was exposed much less telling those you know, individuals downstream, those customers or those vendors or those regulators who had, you know, state or, or federal requirements to be notified based off of their industry regulations, right? So I think that's the first thing I would foot stomp again. Related to preparedness, though, specifically, 
Um, strategic assurance, again, it's 40% of the, the, my time is spent 40% in the strategic assurance space, helping clients develop those playbooks and plans. And I don't mean just the technical incident response playbooks, but what about those non-technical response playbooks for your comms team, for your legal team, for procurement and finance? You know, if you think about what's gonna happen in an incident, it's all hands on deck. Every need, everyone needs to be positioned to help out. As part of those plans and playbooks, do you have out-of-band comms to, to pivot to, right? Do you, if your, your corporate network's bricked, how are you going to communicate? How are you gonna activate those responders? Do they know um, what their role is in responding, right? So making sure you define those roles and responsibilities ensuring you have a primary and a secondary responding. Because again, a threat actor is not gonna call you Monday to Friday between nine and five. They're gonna hit you on the weekends, on holidays, right? So making sure you have thoroughly detailed and documented those, again, responders and their activities. Um, the other piece of it is testing, right? So once you have those playbooks and plans is formulating both technical exercises as well as executive exercises. And don't just do it with the primary responders, make sure you bring in those delegates because you know one day that, that chief of comms or that chief of legal is gonna be out of town and you wanna make sure you can rely on those, those backups because incident response is not gonna be a day or hours, it's usually weeks, months, right? So you need to be prepared for the long haul. Um, and then again, I'll just put a plug in too the threat actors are gonna exploit, it's gonna happen. There's only two categories of organizations, those who have been victim uh, to a cyber attack and those who are soon to be victim. So definitely make sure you're constantly reviewing and refreshing those plans and playbooks and that you also have them you know, out of band as well, right, so. Can I pick up on one thing? Oh, go ahead. Sure, absolutely. I, I'm actually gonna pick up on what you said. <laughs> no, I, I think we were really motivated to do this panel because we recognize that this is something that is incredibly overwhelming. I mean, you, yeah. you, you hit on it. This is a really overwhelming problem. Supply chain attacks are an overwhelming problem. So when we were thinking about what could we bring to you, it was what is in your control? And that, that's why we're starting to really focus on things like the data governance, we're talking about incident response preparedness, we're talking about general preparedness, we're talking about vendors, and all the things we're talking about because there are certain things that will be completely out of your control. You may not be in a position to control the build process of the software <laughs> that you're going to use or the build process of the things that you are using for security because we're telling you these are the best practices and the best things that you need for security when those are the things that are now being compromised. So since you may not be in that position, what can you do? How can we start to break things down to be valuable to you to say, okay, what can I take back to my organization to be better positioned today than I was yesterday or the day before? And I think that's where we're starting to say you can start to break it down into a few steps. You know, we, Jen and I talk about this all the time about good, good hygiene, right? Basic hygiene is absolutely critical. The, that multi-factor authentication is critical. And that multi-factor authentication, if, if placed in more and more places, can alert you to some of the threat activity that we're seeing because the threat actors are moving around and using access to various things. And that could be the first alert. That could be a detection opportunity for you to take action before the threat actor takes is able to uh, further their attack and get into the data. If you're able to add those uh, protections around your data like we're talking about. Maybe you can't do all of it all at once, but you can start to break it down into how can I start to delete data? How can I start to move it to places where I can better store and secure it and encrypt it so that it wouldn't be useful to a threat actor? How can I better detect the people who are trying to access data? You know, one of the, one of the key tips is think about what data do you have that's valuable to you and what data do you have that's valuable to an attacker? Those might be the same, those might be different. Some of the information that's really critical to an attacker is your cybersecurity insurance policy. If you put alerts around anybody trying to get access to that document, you might be alerted to an attacker. So there's, there are steps that you can take even though it's an overwhelming problem, but we want to bring some of those to the forefront today. 
I was just going to pick up on, on one thing that Jen had said about testing things and being ready. There's kind of okay. two things that I would love to see clients do more of in the readiness bucket. One is having someone who knows sort of where the key vendor commercial contracts are located. Big companies may have a, a very good, some, some do, a very good contract management system. Others, as Jen said, sometimes you have an incident and people are struggling. You might not have access to all of your typical files, but where are your key vendor agreements? Where are your key supplier agreements so someone can understand you know, what your rights and responsibilities are? Ideally, that might be done well in advance, but if you're you know, having a very bad day, you wanna be able to find at least the key big ones so you can prioritize. The other thing from preparedness with the um, multiplying incident reporting obligations that are coming online, one question I often ask clients is, who's actually going to make the notification? Who's gonna decide it? Who's your decider, right? Lots of people on an IR team. You do the stand-up calls, you're getting the updates, you know, you're, you're, you're talking to your forensics, you're talking to your lawyers, but who actually is responsible for logging on to the government portal and making the report? How are you going to quality control it to make sure it's accurate, right? These reports um, are submitted under usually um, 18 U.S.C. 1001, so you have to be accurate to the government. Um, and so who's gonna be doing that? I personally think that takes a ton of time away from incident responders, and I and others will be telling DHS that repeatedly as they develop their new rules, but having a sense of who's really responsible, and that's the purpose, the utility of a tabletop exercise, and it can be applied to supply chain as well, who is really gonna be the one who's gonna pick up the phone and call that vendor and say, no, we really are serious, we need that information, and, and I've asked my lawyers to look at the contract clause and we're entitled to it, or you're not because your contracts aren't written great, but um, th that, those are kind of two things that come to me, mind of being ready for that sort of incident it's knowing where your contract, your key contract terms are. Have you thought about it? Is it time to revisit them? And then who's actually picking up the phone or dialing into the DC3 website to start filling out the, the form? Um, that yeah. keeps me up at night. And all that is dependent on what the reporting requirements are, which, which can change depending on which regulator is, is involved. So there's quite a myriad uh, of areas that, that, that victims, companies have to navigate during a tough time. So um, this has been a really great discussion and what I'd like to do is give each of you an opportunity to, to give our audience some final thoughts before we open it up for questions and, and, and answers. So you know, Megan, I'll go back to you in terms of preparation for cyber incident response and, and, and legal exposure. What do you think that, that organizations should be thinking about in, in this arena? I mean, I, I mentioned the contract review. I think trying to get a handle on what your legal exposure is gonna be, looking at your insurance and understanding really, because a lot of my touch points are with the legal department, who's doing what at that, at that crisis moment? And sometimes in-house lawyers are surprised it's them, that they're often the one that the head swivels to um, when a, a decision has to be made. So having a handle on you know, who you need to talk to, we've touched a little bit on sort of government reporting, but also the prudential side, the non-obligatory reporting. I think, Aaron, you mentioned getting information out, but you know, are you gonna pick up the phone and call the FBI? Are you going to call your vendors? Um, what, what role is, is your lawyer going to play? Because that's uh, sort of my head. But sort of getting those, uh, just thinking about it in advance, ideally practicing it, but having a sense of really who's responsible for what. Right, that's great. So, so Jen, following up on, again, our preparedness theme, what do you think companies should be thinking about in terms of training their workforce? Yeah, training the workforce is, is definitely important. And the fact, as I mentioned earlier, you know, security is everyone's role and everyone's responsibility. And you, you may need to call upon more than your typical response team, right? So being prepared to do that. And as part of that, you know, we mentioned train the human, right? Because mm -hmm. again, your employees may be the first one recognizing, um, you know, a potential attack that's underway, right? And so do they know what to do with that information? Do they know how to flag and alert your teams? Right, and as part of that, also proactively sharing emerging trends, right? What's old is new again. We saw this past fall with the, the casino attacks, the use of social engineering, right? That has really emerged too. And are your employees going to be able to recognize social engineering in your domains? The second piece is we've seen the foreign talent recruitment program still existing. So again, what's old is new again. So hopefully you walk away from this and aren't 
fearful, but have some actions and concrete steps to take in order to prepare your organizations in responding for the future. That's great. So Aaron, any final thoughts on um, how organizations can enhance their, in their incident response and preparedness? Yeah, I think two, uh, two things. One, we've talked a lot about government, government response, government reaction, and then we've talked a lot about as a, as a victim, what are you doing? Are, how are you communicating, especially during the incident? But I'm also thinking you need a communication strategy around what do you, what do, you do with the government engagement after? Because a lot of things happen. When there's a significant incident, the, the, the train of government starts to move. And it, a whole host of, of organizations and agencies start to get involved. And you need to have a decision, you can have a voice in that. And I encourage you to have a voice in that because there, you need a communication strategy to say, how am I going to continue to engage with government as they are making policy decisions, as they're changing laws, as they're introducing new uh, legal requirements or regulatory requirements, have a voice in that process. I think that's an important strategy now that previously wouldn't have even been contemplated by, by individual companies and organizations. The second thing I'll say is again, you are at RSA. Explore the technologies that can help you get ahead of these and give you the defender's advantage because there are things that are out there today that didn't even exist two years ago or even two months ago. So I highly encourage you to see what's out there, get with the vendors, see what you can use for your defender's advantage. Thank you. So that brings us to our apply slide and our lessons learned. We've covered the threat landscape. We've talked about some best practices in terms of enhancing data protection, enhancing your security posture, training the human, which is just a phrase I love, um, and then of course some, some legal considerations as well. So now it's time for us to open it up to any questions that you all might have in the remaining time and if you would step to the microphones and, and maybe identify yourself, your name and your affiliation. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for your insights. Really appreciate all three of you taking the time uh, to share your expertise. My question is really more about uh, open source software and what kind of visibility organizations can get into open source software. Maybe one way to focus it would be to think about the, the recent near miss with XZ utils. What could organizations have done ahead of time so if something like that lands, they're not completely taken aback? There, there are no contracts, per se, that we can round up in that case. Thank you. Yeah, we think about that in two ways. One is understanding the risk of using it, right? I mean, it's great that it's out there. It's really important to, to explore and use, but understanding the risk, because there are also enterprise-grade uh, capabilities that, that might be better suited for what you are trying to use the open source for. So you have to do that risk evaluation yourself and think in terms of what kind of data am I putting in there, what kind of queries am I, am I putting, what, what am I trying to get from it, what do I need it to do, and how sensitive is that or how important is that to my business? Because you may need to explore the enterprise version, right, that, that, that will get you the security you need. On, but to answer the other part of your question is, technology companies like Google and others, we are absolutely looking at increasing transparency around what we're putting out there. That's a critical part of being a leader in these areas, and we, we welcome and we've, we've subjected ourselves to third party testing. We continue to uh, bring more visibility into what's going into it, what can you expect, and that's, that's an area that we're getting far more proactive about because we recognize that there's been a real push to get the technology out there, but we want to increase transparency in the responsible use and deployment of it. I have clients all over the place on the open source, um, non-open source issues, so I'll just encourage folks to pay attention to what DHS and others are doing on software security. And there's an attestation that they put out for government contractors that got a lot of focus um, sort of last year and into this year. So the issues, I think, are, are interesting, complicated, and ripe for uh, government action. Yes, sir. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Tim Lee, GRC manager with Chipotle. Thanks uh, for your time up here today. but. One of the biggest risks that I see um, is not the response part of the incident, but the lack of contract terms uh, and the varying degree of contract terms out there, um, whether it be third party risk management or supply chain uh, risk management or whatever. How do we deal with delegated purchasing authority and non-centralized contract management for terms and conditions, whether we talk about data privacy or AI governance or 
uh, a business critical supplier for supplies and services or whatever. How do we fix that problem? Golly, I don't know that I have a solution to fix it, um, but I think you know what we advise clients is to you know do their risk assessment that includes key vendors and really think about what terms. A lot of a lot of contracts have language that's old and has not really been thoughtfully updated. Um, and one question we see folks wrestling with is are are your expectations going to be reciprocal? What do you actually want? And if you're going to demand it of, of a third party, are you prepared to give it, right? And that applies to sort of incident response support, notifications and the like. I don't have a, a solution to it. It is a real problem and I think it's going to come under increasing government pressure as you see in the cybersecurity framework, you see in the cyber performance goals from DHS, this expect, expectation for contract language. But I don't think the regulator knows what that contract language should look like. Um, and we haven't seen, frankly, a lot of business to business litigation over the adequacy of contract terms. Uh, so I, I think that is a, a very interesting and, and complicated area. Uh, that's a total dodge, but <laughs> that's what I can do. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. I'll, I'll, actually, I'll, let me just add to that for just a second. Um, the bad news is we have had many vendors compromised, mm -hmm. right? What I think that does is give you far more leverage to set higher expectations with your vendors and go to your vendors and say, look, there are problems. And there are problems that you never intended to have, but they're happening and they're being exploited and they're hurting, they're hurting us, right? The, the, the uh, customers. I think that puts you in a better position now to start to have those op the open dialogue, to have to encourage a lot more of those um, interactions of how will we be ready, how can we be prepared, because frankly it's not good for the vendor or the customer. And I think that what's happening today opens a door for you to have those conversations and to start to negotiate from a different perspective and a different position now than, than maybe years ago. Okay, thank you. Sir? Um, yeah, I understand we're out of time. So kind of going back to the thesis, uh, we can't control our supply chains, so what should we do about the fact that that's going to happen? Um, can you say that there's anything in particular that you should do different because some attack is a supply chain attack as opposed to any other attack? Uh, that's pretty much it. Or, or would this be just general attack preparedness that you're ultimately coming back to? Well, we, we talked a little bit before the session about um, tabletop exercises with key vendors. I mean, that's just one little bitty example of if in your risk assessment you've determined that you've got you know 25 critical vendors who if they went if they had a problem or if you had a problem that affected them would you know you'd have to be in it with them to exchange information or you know um, cooperate in some way then you know I think I haven't seen a lot of it being done I don't know if Jen has but that would be one small thing to do with sort of a few key vendors. So specific to progress move it, you know, there were over 2,000 organizations that were victimized as part of that incident. And just think about the volume and the number of inquiries, right? Every company wanted to know what data was impacted. And so that was really tough. And it, it fell to the individual organizations to try and look and see what did they put up into their file transfer, you know, system. Um, at the time, progress just could not re respond. Um, in, in many cases, they didn't have an obligation and contract to respond, right? So as they could get information, they did, but it wasn't um, a requirement. So that's the key, again, going back to make it a requirement. Okay. Sir, your question, please. Um, <clears throat> October 18 this year, um, in Europe, uh, the NIST 2 regulation uh, is uh, getting effective. Um, personally putting every uh, CEO of anybody who puts a product in this uh, in the critical infrastructure area to the uh, towards the European market into personal liability <clears throat> with his private money what do you ex uh, what do you um, for example do at Google with the CEO to put his money somewhere safe <laughs> I think we're out of time now <laughs> 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 Thank you for the question. No, I think it's, I, there, the, obviously that's a concern, right? So one of the things that we've taken on, as, as have others, is we have to not only be able to put security in every step of the build process 
think of security from the very beginning all the way through the life cycle of whatever that product is and have ways to continually test not only internally from ourselves but also opening ourselves up to third party testing because that is what's going to give us the ability to detect things, to detect problems before it goes out to the masses and, put, and makes others vulnerable to something. Uh, we are using automation to do that. We're using AI capabilities to do that because those are capabilities that can probably get to the heart of, of vulnerabilities that maybe humans may have missed, right? So there are many things that we're doing to layer protections in and integrate security every step of the way to be able to prevent those things from happening. That's great. Thank you. I think we have time for one final question. Yeah, so you talk about um, enhancing data protection, and so I'm kind of curious about the role that DLP technologies play in that and what organizations, what you see organizations doing that are the most successful in employing DLP technologies, since they're... I mean, just at a high level, just, and, and I'll let others um, answer as well, but I think at a high level, the, the, the DLP is there to help enforce the policy that you need it to enforce. So it really starts with making sure that you understand the policy and what that, what that technology is going to do for you and what it's not going to do for you. And then I think the other piece of that is really thinking about how do you restrict access to the data and because the DLP is trying to keep it from going out, right? But you wanna make sure that you're also assessing not letting people in to that data first. So I think of it in those two parts and I do think that the technology is there to, to assist you but out, outside of that, I'm. Well, thank you. We're, we're out of time. Oh, sorry. Uh, please oh, remember your surveys. We, we can and talk to you later. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Have a great conference. Thank, thank you. you.